we're moving on to chapter five. The learning objectives are to define the key terms associated with radiation protection, describe in detail the basics of patient protection before x-ray exposure, discuss the different types of filtration, and state recommended total filtration for dental x-ray machines operating above and below 70 kV, describe the collimator used in dental x-ray machines, and state the recommended diameter of the useful beam at the patient's skin. To list six ways to protect the patient from excessive radiation during x-ray exposure, describe the importance of receptor handling and processing after patient exposure to x-radiation, discuss operator protection in terms of adequate distance, shielding, and avoidance of the useful beam, and describe personnel and equipment monitoring devices used to detect radiation. You'll be able to discuss radiation exposure guidelines, including radiation safety legislation, maximum permissible dose, and the ALARA concept, discuss with the dental patient radiation protection steps used before, during, and after exposure to x-radiation. The overall purpose of this chapter is going to be to discuss patient protection before, during, and after exposure to x-radiation. X radiation. We're going to detail operator protection methods and we need to present radiation exposure and safety guidelines. This chapter also is going to include a discussion of patient education about radiation protection. So like we talked about in chapter four, patient protection here is because X radiation causes biological changes in living cells. It adversely affects all living tissue. So because no matter what we do, it will damage to some degree, our goal is going to be to minimize the amount of radiation received by the patient. And we need to maximize the benefits of radiation to our patients. This is going to include the techniques that we're going to use before, during, and after the procedure that we do to protect the patient and to get the best diagnostic quality from our x-rays and our x-ray radiation. With the use of proper patient protection techniques, the amount of X radiation received by the dental patient can be minimized. Okay, so before we expose our patients to X radiation, we're going to talk about uh, who's going to prescribe dental radiographs and how they go about prescribing those radiographs. And then we're also going to talk about the proper equipment that we need to use. So dental images, because we need to evaluate risk versus benefit, they have to be prescribed by a licensed dentist. And here, it's it, it's the dentist needs to use his professional judgment or her professional judgment to determine the number of x-rays, the type of, of radiographs, and the frequency of how often we're going to take radiographs for the individual. The ADA Council on Scientific Affairs, in conjunction with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Public Health Service, Food and Drug Administration, has adopted guidelines for prescribing the number, type, and frequency of dental images. Every patient should be evaluated on an individual basis to determine what x-ray images are necessary. slide. If you turn to page 44, there is a wonderful table. It's table 5-1 about the recommendations for prescribing dental radiographs. This goes into some of the factors that dentists should be taking under uh, consideration when they are prescribing radiographs for their patients. Uh, for this slide, the proper equipment is going to be the use of equipment that complies with state and federal radiation guidelines and to minimize the radiation that a patient receives. So we're going to be talking about filtration, the differences between inherent filtration, added filtration, and total filtration. We'll talk about collimation, and we'll also talk about position indicating devices. You guys cannot get away from this concept. The x-ray tube head should be properly equipped with aluminum filters, a lead collimator, and a PID in order to do the best job we can for our patients. Okay, so inherent filtration takes place when the primary beam passes through the glass window of the x-ray tube, goes through the insulating oil, and through the tube head seal. The inherent filtration of the dental x-ray machine is equivalent to approximately 0.5 to one millimeters worth of aluminum. Inherent filtration alone does not meet those, the standards regulated by state and federal law. Therefore, 
added filtration is required. And so here, what we're looking at is this little window here. We're looking through this oil right here, and we're looking through this tube head seal. This tiny space here, all three of these together, this is inherent filtration. So added filtration refers to the placement of aluminum discs in the path of the x-ray beam between the collimator and the tube head seal in the dental x-ray machine. Aluminum discs can be added to the tube head in 0.5 millimeter increments. The purpose of aluminum discs is to filter out the longer wavelength, low energy x-rays from the x-ray beam. The longer wavelength, lower energy x-ray beams are not penetrating and so therefore we do not need them to go on out towards our patients. We want to stop those slower wavelengths so that only the, the strong, um, faster, higher penetrating wavelengths, those are, are going to be what makes up the beam that we send toward our patient. Awesome. So here is a really great picture of that and you can find this picture on page 42 I'm sorry, 43 in your book. This is that aluminum filter right here in the middle. And you can see these long and short wave. My dog is sneezing in the background. I'm sorry. Um, so we can see these longer waves right here. These are slow. And these shorter ones, these ones with the good squiggles, these guys are going to be the ones that make it through this aluminum filter. And that's because we don't want these long, slow waves to hit our patients and cause unnecessary damage or unnecessary radiation toward our patient. We only want the good ones, the ones that are going to penetrate what they need to in order to get over to the uh, receptor. All right. So if we add together inherent uh, filtration and the added filtration, we have what is called total filtration. I know, mind-boggling. So the machines that operate at or below 70 kVp require a total of 1.5 millimeters aluminum filtration. Machines operating at above 70 kVp require a minimum total of 2.5 millimeters of aluminum filtration. And we know from that earlier slide that um, the, the inherent was about 0.5 to, well, this is terrible, 0 0.0 <laughs> millimeters. It's really hard to write with a, with a mouse. And we know that that is our inherent. So we know now we could easily find the difference between 0.5 or 1 millimeters worth of inherent filtration and then however many of those aluminum discs we need to add in 0.5 millimeter increments is how much we would need to in order to get to machines either above or below 70 kVp. Okay, so next we have collimation, and this is done with a collimator or a lead collimator. Collimation restricts the size and shape of the x-ray beam. It is going to reduce patient exposure. This is, you can see, either a circular collimation or a rectangular collimation. A down here, you can see this teal circle in, in the shape of a circle. And then in B, you see that teal rectangle. That teal rectangle is actually about the size of a size 2 image receptor, either with a digital sensor or a size 2 film. And then all of this yellow is the difference here between a rectangular collimator or a circular collimator, and all of this yellow is excess radiation that we don't need to send toward our patients. So um, moral of the story here is that rectangular collimation is less radiation than circular. So more about collimation. Here you can see an image of both a round collimator and a rectangular collimator. And you can see the difference in the shape of the beam that it sends out towards its patient. It's also important to note that this little collimator is located between this, the tube, and over here, the PID. Okay, so the collimator is located between the tube and the PID. The circular or the round collimator produces a cone-shaped beam, which is 2.75 inches in diameter. That's important because federal regulations require that the beam be collimated to a diameter of no more than 2.75 inches. Convenient. Then we have the rectangular beam, the rectangular collimator, which produces the rectangular beam, which is slightly larger than a number two size film. 
And next we have the position indicating device. This is an extension of the x-ray tube head that we use to direct the x-ray beam toward whatever it is we're going to take a radiograph of. It can be conical, rectangular, or round. Conical PIDs are no longer used in dentistry because they actually scatter the radiation more so than what we need them to. Rectangular and round PIDs usually come in either 8 or 16 inch lengths. They are open-ended and they are lead-lined. We'll get into the difference between 8 and 16 inches in a minute. The long PID produces the least divergence of the x-ray beam. And because it has the least amount of divergence, it also reduces the amount of, sca of scatter radiation, which you might see on your boards. So what I want you to take from this is that the 16 inch uh, PID is better than the eight. Okay, so here we can see that lead collimator on the one side um, where the x-ray tube where it first exits, that's the lead collimator, and then the PID. Now the end of the PID, when it's round like that, can be no more than 2.75 inches. Yes, the lead collimator is part of keeping that um, beam to be that size, but the end, the tip of the PID, that is also going to be two point, no more, I'm sorry, no more than 2.75 inches. Okay, so here's that difference between the 8-inch PID and the 16-inch PID. The difference is the shape of the cone. So if we start and we uh, restrict that, the, the spread or the divergence of the beam as it comes away from that focal point, then we're able to get a much more narrow beam, as we can see on the bottom picture here, than we can if we have a very short PID here. So that is the reason why we always use a 16 inch PID in order to reduce radiation exposure to our patients over the eight inch PID. Okay, so now we're gonna move into during exposure. And we wanna reduce the radiation that our patients receive by using these proper techniques. And so by that, we're going to use a thyroid collar. We're gonna use a lead apron. We'll use uh, different types of image receptors beam alignment devices, exposure factor selection, or that KVPMA exposure time situation, and then proper technique, which we'll get into more too. Okay, so first up is the thyroid collar. This is gonna be a flexible lead shield that we place around the patient's neck to protect the thyroid gland from scatter radiation. We'll say it again. The thyroid collar protects the thyroid gland from scatter radiation. Thyroid thyroid. And it may be separate or it could be a part of the lead apron. At Concord, it's going to be attached to the lead apron, so it's very hard to miss. It's, it's pretty obvious if you're not using a thyroid collar because it's just hanging there. It is recommended for all intraoral exposures. Anytime you put a sensor inside a patient's mouth, they need to have a thyroid collar on. It is not recommended for extraoral exposures. And the difference here is that on a panoramic x-ray, the thyroid collar is actually going to get in the way and it's going to block some of the image. So we don't use a thyroid collar on extraoral exposures, only ones that go inside the mouth because we want to protect our patient's thyroid. Next up is the thyroid collar's cousin, the lead apron. It's going to be placed over the patient's chest and lap to protect the reproductive organs and blood-forming tissues from scatter radiation. That might be on your boards. Um, using a lead apron is often going to be a state law. I had this idea that I was going to make you guys pick states and then like figure out if the if the lead apron was um, a necessary, like a state law in that state, but um, I decided to, to give you guys a break. The lead shield that the lead apron is made of needs to be at least 0.25 millimeters worth of lead or lead equivalent in order to be effective. Okay, so remember how our uh, aluminum discs inside the tube head have to be 0.5? Well, the lead inside the lead apron has to be half that, 0.25. Many states mandate the use of a lead apron. I do want to say that Texas is not one of them, but at Concord and at school, it is mandated. So you do have to use a lead apron. If you are taking x-rays without a lead apron on your patient, you uh, will not get a very good grade. Dental radiographers should ensure that the lead apron and thyroid collar are stored 
properly and are not folded because if you fold it, it will crease that lead and it will cause that lead sort of plate that's inside there, that flexible lead, it'll cause it to crack. And when it cracks, then it lets uh, x-rays pass through, right? Care should be taken not to touch the apron with the same gloves that were used to place the film in the patient's mouth as this will cause cross-contamination. The outside of the lead apron is it is a smooth surface, but it's not entirely non-porous, and so it's not cleaned easily. We'll get into um, you know, more of that infection control and how to properly place the, the um, apron on the patient. You guys will practice that this week, and um, how to, like the steps that you'll need to take in order to place the lead apron, take your x-rays, clean everything up, and then take the lead apron off of your patient. But the main thing that we want to get here, across here is that it should be stored properly. It's stored on hooks, and you'll see once we get into the clinic that we, we hook the, the thyroid collar and um, um, store it a certain way so that it does not uh, get cracked. Okay, so then next up we have image receptors. And these might seem kind of strange to put on the list of things that protect your patients from X radiation, but they're probably one of the most important ways of reducing patients' exposure to radiation is based on the type of uh, image receptor you're using and the film if you're using, the film speed if you're using film. So digital image receptors require less radiation exposure of the patient. So we're going to have to to uh, have a shorter exposure time uh, in order to get a diagnostic image from a digital receptor than we would from a film receptor. And that's very important when you're out working in private practice and you're using uh, either film or digital. It's important to know, are you using the safest method of taking um, X radiation on your patients? The size of the silver bromide crystals inside those film is the main factor in determining the film's speed. The larger the crystals, the faster the film. When digital sensors are not used, fast film is the most effective method for reducing a patient's exposure to X radiation. So first up, the number one hands down uh, gold winner is gonna be the digital sensor. Then we have F speed, and then next slowest is D speed. Here in the United States, the standard is either F speed film, if your office still uses film, or using a digital sensor. And there's more than one type of digital receptor, um, and so we'll get into more of those too, but digital always, always, always wins over film. So next up is a beam alignment device. And there's a difference between a beam alignment device and a receptor holder, but we'll talk about that later. So the beam alignment device is going to stabilize the receptor in the mouth, and it's going to reduce the chance for movement. It's also going to tell the radiographer where to place the PID properly in order to take the best diagnostic image of the area that needs to be uh, radiographed, and it's going to reduce the number of unnecessary retakes. So film holding devices also assist the operator in properly positioning the film and the PID, thus decreasing the chance for retakes. Next is our exposure factor selection. So here we want to use uh, enough, high enough KVP in milliampage in order to get the, the radiograph that we need, but we want to use a low enough one that we're not unnecessarily exposing our patients to uh, X radiation. And so adjusting the KVP, the milliampage, and the time settings on the control panel to limit the amount of X radiation exposure received by the patient is going to reduce the overall radiation that we have uh, going at our patients. The setting between 60 to 70 KVP is the standard uh, for milliampage. It's between 6 and 8 milliampage, and the time setting always changes. It's important to use the correct um, time setting, the correct button that correlates with the type of radiograph you're taking in order to reduce the radiation in areas where it can be reduced. So proper technique. Yes, this does mean in some ways using the, you know, paralleling or bite wing or occlusal uh, techniques in order to get the right diagnostic image. But what it also means is doing that technique properly in order to get a diagnostic image. 
non-diagnostic images have to be retaken if we didn't capture the part of the the structure of the mouth that we need to be able to see in order to give a diagnosis then we have to take it again and a re-exposure of an image should be avoided at all times it is important to know exactly what type of x-ray uh, what kind of area the doctor needs to be able to see in order to uh, give that diagnosis and try to limit the, the number of times we have to retake that radiograph. Retakes are a major cause of unnecessary radiation to patients and must be avoided at all costs. Having to retake images wastes time and most of the time our patients really don't appreciate that. If a retake is ordered, the radiograph the radiographer should know how to correct the error that's going to result in the need for a retake. So when we look at our radiographs, Every time we look at our radiographs, we're going to be looking for what's wrong with this x-ray and how can I make it better? What should I do? Should I move the PID distally? Should I move it you know, uh, more superior? We're going to be looking at those things on how we can improve our technique in order to reduce the amount of retakes we have to take on our patients. Okay, so from the time we take that radiograph until you know they're processed and they're viewed and they're used diagnostically, carefully handling them is crucial. So we need to go after proper receptor handling and artifacts caused by improper film handling result in non-diagnostic films, then proper film processing and image retrieval. So improper film processing may necessitate retakes, needlessly exposing the patient to excess radiation. This doesn't just include film. So if you are not saving on the computer properly or you're not loading up properly when you are starting to take your radiographs on your patient, you could very easily lose images on the computer just as easily as you could mess up the processing of the film. And so I don't want you to think that just because you're using digital that everything is going to be beautiful and you don't have to worry once those images are taken. If you're not saving them properly or you're not using the sensor properly, then you could easily ha lose those images and have to retake them too. All right, so enough with the patient. Let's talk about us. Now we're going to be talking about the operator on our protection guidelines and our radiation monitoring. Okay, so first up, these are the things we need to do to stay out of the primary beam. Okay, there's going to be distance recommendations, position recommendations, and shielding recommendations. To keep radiation exposure to zero, the dental radiographer has to carefully follow these safety guidelines and use radiation monitoring devices. The distance and position recommendations that in order to maintain an adequate distance during exposure, the radiographer must stand at least six feet away from the tube head during exposure. If you can't get six feet away, then you should stand behind a suitable barrier, one that is lead lined. So a wall or a lead lined uh, window is going to be the uh, protective barrier for you there. And so to avoid the primary beam when you are taking certain types of radiographs, you're going to want to stand at either a 90 degree to 135 degree angle to the beam. You're not going to stand directly behind the tube head or uh, any closer than 90 degrees uh, in, in from where the tube head exits, from where the x-ray exits the tube head. To avoid the primary beam, proper operator position during exposure includes never ever ever holding a receptor in place for a patient and never st uh, stand and hold the tube head still for the patient in order to take that radiograph. The dental radiographers, when they work in a new office, it's going to be important to get there early enough and familiarize yourself with where you're going to need to stand in order to take those radiographs. All right, shielding recommendations. So most offices in their design will incorporate some of those protective barriers. You can see here how they, uh, the radiographer has those uh, x-rays uh, going on in the room, but in order to push the exposure button, he actually has to leave the room and stand behind this wall in order to push this button. So there is sometimes a, a lead wall to stand behind. At Concord, there's a wall that has a window in it, so you can see what the what the patient is doing with that, um, with the the extensor. And then um, mo most of the time, though, the exposure button is outside the room, and so you have to leave the room to push the button. 
Next is radiation monitoring. So the equipment needs to be monitored. So every so often, um, every state has a different regulation and federal regulations will also uh, dictate this, but how often the x-ray machine has to be monitored for radiation leakage. And then each person who operates that radiation machine, that person needs to wear a monitoring badge. It should be worn at waist level when you're taking radiographs. And then it gets mailed or it gets tested. Um, usually it's about once a month. Sometimes it's a little longer. It depends on the type of badge. And it gets evaluated based on the uh, level of radiation that it is being exposed to. These monitoring devices are usually small and they're light. And so you can uh, place them um, on your uniform without them you know, interfering with anything that you have going on. The monitoring devices are usually sent to the agency monthly and a new one is returned to the operators along with a report to the dentist showing radiation exposure results for each individual. Okay, so now we're gonna get into some of these guidelines. We have radiation safety legislation, which is going to talk about the maximum permissible dose, the cumulative occupational dose, and the ALARA concept. Radiation exposure guidelines have been established to protect the patient and the operator from excess radiation. Strict adherence to radiation exposure guidelines is mandatory for all dental radiographers. You can get in a lot of trouble for not following radiation guidelines. Okay, so legislation has been established at both the state and federal levels to protect the patient the operator, and the general public from radiation hazards. Radiation legislation varies pretty much from state to state, and the dental radiographer must be familiar with the laws that apply to his or her own workplace. The Radiation Control for Health and Safety Act came out in 1968. That, you might see that again, that 1968. Oh, so this, this might be on your boards the uh, maximum permissible dose or the MPD. The maximum per permissible dose is equivalent that a body is permitted, I'm sorry, is the maximum dose equivalent that a body is permitted to receive in a specific period. The MPD for occupationally exposed persons is 50 millisieverts per year or 0 0.05 sieverts per year or 5.0 rem per year. For non-occupational occupationally exposed persons, it is one millisievert per year or 0.1 rem per year. For occupationally exposed pregnant women, the MPD is 0.5 millisieverts per month during the pregnancy months. The amount of radiation to the whole body carries very little chance of injury. Dental personnel should strive for an occupational dose of zero by adhering to strict radiation protection practices. The National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements, the NCRP, establishes these standards. The International Commission on Radiological Protection, or the ICRP, also establishes recommendations. They don't always agree with one another. However, here in the United States, you're going to be following the National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements. All right, so next we have cumulative occupational dose. The cumulative occupational dose is the dose accumulated over a lifetime. It's pretty straightforward. Cumulative or accumulated, right? An individual's cumulative occupational effective dose should not exceed the worker's age multiplied by 10 millisieverts. So if the worker is 60, then 60 times 10 is 600. So the individual should not have uh, been exposed to more than 600 millisieverts in their lifetime. In order to begin um, working with radiation and to become certified in this, you have to be at least 18 years old. And so everyone's kind of given those first 18 years where they really shouldn't be exposed to too much radiation. All right, so the ALARA concept. This thing is probably going to be on your boards. It's not going to go anywhere. You're going to see this for the rest of your career. The ALARA concept stands for as low as reasonably achievable. It means that you will do every single thing in your power to reduce the amount of radiation that is employed. It means that you're going to reduce the amount of radiation your patients are exposed to. You're going to reduce the amount of radiation you are exposed to. You're going to reduce the amount of radiation that is in the air. At all times, you are taking whatever... Uh, measures that you have to take in order to reduce that radiation exposure. 
And what are some of those precautions that we take in order to abide by the Alara concept? Well, radiographs should only be ordered for diagnostic purposes. It means we shouldn't be taking them just for fun. We use the lowest possible KVP, MA, and exposure time, right? We don't want to send too many x-rays at our patients for no reason. We're going to use F-speed film or we're going to use digital radiography. More likely, we're going, we need to use digital. We're going to use a longer PID with a rectangular shape, right? So we're gonna use that 16 inch PID with a rectangular shape. We're going to use a tube head with an aluminum filter and a lead collimator. And we're going to use a lead apron and a thyroid collar. We're going to use film holding devices. We're going to avoid retakes. And we're going to test our equipment for efficiency and proper functioning. We're going to do everything we possibly can that was outlined in this chapter in order to reduce the amount of radiation that we are exposing. Okay, so this part gets into what we're going to be talking about in our discussion board, the radiation protection and using patient education. So what you say to the patient before, during, and after the procedure, what the patient education may take the form of an informal conversation, or we might even give them some printed literature. The dental radiographer must be prepared to explain exactly how patients are protected before, during, and after, right? When our patients are concerned about how much radiation we are exposing them to, the factors that were in this chapter, the ways that we protect our patients, the ways we protect ourselves, the state and federal mandates that have come out in order to protect everyone, those are the things that we need to be telling our patients about so that they feel more comfortable and they know that we have their best interests at heart. It may be useful to have like an educational brochure on hand that's going to explain the importance of, di of diagnostic dental radiographs and how their benefits outweigh the risks. Some dental facilities also have informative videos that can help educate patients about dental radiographs. It might be a good idea to save some of that type of information on your computer in your operatory and that way you can share that with your patients. So that is it for chapter five. If you have questions, please post them in the question and answer discussion board uh, or send me an email.